Hello everyone, welcome to the Tech and Auto Show. I'm your host Manav Sinha and it is so good to see all you lovely people once again. Now, just like every week, this week as well, we are getting you the action both from the world of technology as well as automobiles at one place. So without any further ado, let's get started by showing you what's coming your way in the next half an hour. This week, the Yamaha MT15 at a racetrack. Vivo's latest competitor, the V15 Pro. And the Nissan Kicks, which can kick up some dirt. So yes, all of that action is coming your way and yes, the amazing Ducati Scrambler 1100 Sport is giving us company today for this episode but we're gonna start off by talking about performance-based commuter motorcycles. Now these brand of motorcycles are getting a lot of attention lately and one of the motorcycles that's got everyone excited right now is the Yamaha MT15. Now it's finally been launched and I got to sample it at the Buddha International Circuit. So we are here at the Buddha International Circuit to test out the latest Yamaha motorcycle that's been launched in India, which is this, the all-new MT-15. Now, the MT-15 is really similar to the R-15, but it approaches things a little bit differently. But if the R-15 is anything to go by, this should be an exciting motorcycle to ride. So without wasting any more time, let's head on to the track to find out more. So let's start with the way this motorcycle looks and boy does it look great. The MT-15 follows the unmistakable design language of a sporty street fighter motorcycle with a compact headlamp unit, a short stubby tail and a muscular fuel tank. The highlight of course is the LED headlamp unit that gives the motorcycle an angry face that will be instantly recognizable wherever you see it. Then the high-rise fuel tank is complemented by the tank shrouds and the radiator fins which make it look butch. I also really like the way the short tail looks with the neatly integrated LED tail lights and with the tail tidy in place, it should look even better. The wheels come with highlights on the rims that look fantastic but I do miss the contrasting rims that the international model gets as that would have really hit it out of the park. Also, you have to give it to Yamaha for giving a neatly designed rear grab rail as it does not look out of place. Another thing that we appreciate is the LCD instrument cluster that's easy to read and has decent visibility as well. And now that we have seen the motorcycle up close, it's time to find out how it rides and on that front, it has borrowed the R15's biggest weapon. Now one of the things that I really liked in the R15 version 3 was the engine on board that came with variable valve actuation system that made it so much more enjoyable. Now the same engine has been carried over to the MT15 but this time around it's in a different state of tune. So what has happened is that it has traded a little bit of top speed for better mid-range acceleration. Oh and speaking of the Yamaha R15, well we did test it last year and were left thoroughly impressed with its racetrack potential but what it lacked was an ABS system. But now Yamaha is offering dual channel ABS on the R15 and we tested that too and the R15 now feels a lot more complete. And speaking of ABS, well the MT15 does get it but it is only a single channel ABS system. And also it does not have the option of Metzilla tyres that the R15 gets. And there's no sportier exhaust option either for the MT15. Thankfully the fantastic 155cc liquid cooled single cylinder engine is still there. It's still one of the best 150cc engines out there and since the MT15 gets a bigger sprocket, it feels a bit more quicker through the gears at lower RPMs. The slip and assist clutch further helps with the lighter feeling clutch and allows for aggressive downshifts too. The biggest difference is in the riding posture. The seat height of the MT15 is lower than the R15 and the rake and trail has been altered for better agility. As a result, the bike feels a lot more comfortable for everyday riding conditions and it feels very responsive for those quick turn-ins. Having said that, the motorcycle still has great mid-corner stability even if it's a bit keen on leaning into it in the first place. As for the suspension, it felt plush on the smooth surface of the Buddha International Circuit but we will have to test it out on the open roads because, let's be honest, most of you out there will ride the MT-15 on city roads and highways and if the first impressions are anything to go by, it is definitely an exciting motorcycle. The big problem with it, however, is not the motorcycle itself. It is the price that it comes at. At an ex-showroom price of Rs 1.36 lakh, it is not aggressively priced in any way and the biggest question you would have to ask yourself is whether to spend Rs 3000 rupees more and get the dual channel equipped and full-fed R15 version 3. 
and if it is a street naked that you are looking for then there is also the Yamaha FZ25 which is a lot cheaper than the MT15. So to sum up my experience with the all new MT15, well I didn't have a lot of time to spend with it but it was enough to tell me that this is a properly exciting motorcycle to ride. Yes, I'm not too sure about the kind of pricing that this one is coming at. So if budget is not a problem for you and you want a motorcycle with a bit of sportiness in it, then this one is actually a good buy. So yes, an extremely popular motorcycle that leads to a little bit of disappointment really. But anyway, it's now time to move on to the world of technology. Now talking about popularity, one of the most popular smartphone price brackets in India is the less than 30,000 rupee price segment. And Vivo has launched a new phone in that segment in the form of the V15 Pro. And by the looks of it, it's got almost everything going for it. A bezel-less display, a pop-up selfie camera, so on and so forth. But is it good enough to be your next buy? Well, Kunal is finding that out. The Vivo Next made headlines last year all thanks to its pop-up selfie camera which completely eliminated the requirement of having a notch above the display. This year, the company is bringing the same concept to its mid-range device. We are going to be looking at the Vivo V15 Pro. The V15 Pro is the latest sub-30,000 rupee smartphone which packs in quite a lot of features. For starters, there is an in-display fingerprint scanner, a triple camera arrangement at the back with a 48 megapixel primary sensor, and for taking selfies, the front camera pops out from the top to take high resolution photos. Yes, that pop-up camera is very similar to last year's Vivo Nex, but the company is now offering the feature in a more affordable package. And unlike the Nex, the V15 Pro's pop-up camera also comes with face unlock. Just swipe up on the lock screen and the camera quickly raises to scan your face and goes back in. The pop-up camera also enabled Vivo to slap on a display that doesn't have any awkward notches or holes. It has a solid looking 6.3 inch Super AMOLED panel which offers great colors and enough brightness to use the phone under harsh sunlight. The handset itself looks quite premium with a gradient color at the back and what seems like a textured finish sitting under a glass back. However, there is no glass and is actually glossy polycarbonate which is also used on the frame sitting in the middle. Nonetheless, it feels worthy of its price. On the inside, you get Qualcomm's new Snapdragon 675 chipset. In fact, it is the first handset on the market sporting the new processor. There is also 6GB of RAM for your multitasking needs and 128GB of inbuilt storage which can be expanded further. This combination translates into a great experience on the device. You can easily glide through multiple apps and even have a great gaming experience. Although I wasn't fully satisfied with the choppy frames on PUBG Mobile. Coming to the cameras which are the highlight, the front 32MP and rear 48MP sensors use quad bear filters, meaning that they are actually 8MP and 12MP sensors which combine pixels to produce the higher resolution photos. Despite that, both the cameras produce fine and sharp looking pictures in daylight and above average photos in low light. It is however best to use the lower resolution unless you want to print your photos on a large canvas. The front camera can take good looking selfies although the aggressive skin softening defeats the purpose of having high resolution in the first place. The one thing that I did like was the ability to take wide angle shots which offer 120 degree of wide field of view. Now there is a 3700mAh battery on the device which easily offers a day's worth of charge. It also comes with Vivo's dual engine fast charging technology now which isn't fast as Oppo's Super VOOC but is fairly good. In my test I managed to charge the phone from 0 to 25% in 14 minutes and hit 75% in about an hour. Notably you get a micro USB port here which is something I did not expect from a sub 30,000 rupees smartphone. Now the Vivo V15 Pro is a very well-rounded smartphone for its asking price. It has a premium design and finish with a solid looking AMOLED display that covers almost the entire front of the device. Even the cameras work great despite the high resolution photos being a result of pixel binning. The company is definitely going to get points for that pop-up mechanism and including a more efficient in-display fingerprint scanner. Now there are a few quirks about this smartphone. 
I've said this in the past as well, but using a micro USB is getting a little old, especially when you're paying close to 30,000 rupees. Also, Vivo's Fun Touch OS is not very good. It's a little complicated, especially when there are so many apps preloaded on the device. Now, sticking to the theme of popular things that we're talking about in this episode, it is now time to talk about cars. Now, when I say popular cars, it has to be an SUV. And Nissan seems to have taken notice of that, as they've now come out with a new SUV called the Nissan Kicks. I got to drive it around, and here's my review of it. So do you remember the Nissan Terrano? Well, it was always a good car to drive, but it needed an update in terms of features that it had. Now though, Nissan has launched an all-new car in the form of this, which is the Nissan Kick. And they've put in extra effort to make sure that this car is just right for the Indian market. But how has all of that turned out to be? And today, we're going to find out. Let's start off with the first thing that one might notice about the new Nissan Kicks. And that is the sheer size of this SUV. And that brings us to the extra effort that Nissan has put in for the Kicks. You see, internationally, the Nissan Kicks is based on the same platform as the one that's shared by the Micra. But for India, the Nissan Kicks uses the MO platform which is meant for their SUVs. The difference that it translates to is that the Kicks is just huge. So much so that the Nissan Kicks is not only the longest car in its segment, but it is also the widest and has the longest wheelbase on offer. And when it comes to height, it is only a bit shorter than the Hyundai Creta. So overall, the Nissan Kicks feels like the biggest car in the segment. That's not it, there are several design changes done to the Indian version of the Kicks in order to make it more SUV-like. And boy does the Kicks look muscular. Starting off with the bold V-shaped grille, which is flanked by sharp LED projector headlamps with LED DRLs, the raised and sculpted bonnet, the chrome accents on the bumper along with cornering lamps and the four skid plate, all give it a very strong stance. And coming to the side, there's a lot of body cladding and there are large 17-inch alloy wheels. But what really makes it work is the floating roof design which is further accentuated by the kink on the rear doors. From the back, the bumper does stick quite far out in relation to the boot lid and the sharply raked rear glass panel along with the boomerang shaped taillights gives the car a unique look. The taillights, however, are not LEDs and we wish that wasn't the case. So yes, the Nissan Kicks looks fantastic from the outside as it looks muscular and has a good stance on road as well. But once you step inside the cabin, you're greeted with rather premium interiors. Now surprisingly, the first thing that you notice is the plush leather that is spread across the dash. And look closer and you will spot several carbon fibre style plastic elements across the cabin and that is a nice touch. The overall design does look great but the quality of materials used could have been a bit better in some places. The cabin ticks all the boxes too as there are enough compartment spaces, it gets a cool glove box and also rear AC vents on offer. But when you do notice the touchscreen infotainment system and engage with it, it is a pleasant experience. The 8-inch touchscreen is fantastic to use and also supports features like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And while all of this sounds great, well, it's not all perfect. If there's one thing that I didn't quite like about the Nissan Kicks is, well, the driving ergonomics. So I'm 5 foot 10, the steering wheel and the driver's seat is height adjustable and having fiddle around, I still feel that I'm seated quite high. Add to that the gear lever which is fantastic to engage with but it feels placed quite low below and it's a bit of a weird situation going on here. But then again this is a bit subjective, some people might like being seated this high but it is something that tall drivers need to keep in mind. And it gets weirder when you engage with the car. For example the plus and minus keys that you see on the steering wheel aren't actually volume controls but are instead meant to adjust the cruise control system which however is activated from this panel which as you can see is not on the steering wheel. The call and volume buttons are on the stock behind the steering wheel and it is not backlit. So it does take a bit of time to adjust to. Thankfully the story is not the same at the back. So when you're seated at the back you have good amount of headroom, shoulder room and knee room on offer. So in simple words it's a good place to be in. And the Nissan Kicks is quick to jump in with its impressive list of features which includes auto headlamps, rain sensing wipers and a fantastic 360 degree parking camera which proves to be very helpful when needed. 
That's not it, the kicks also get several safety features like 4 airbags in the top end variant along with hill start assist and ESP. But what's the best part about the kicks is the driving experience. We drove the diesel engine powered variant that uses a 1.5 litre 4 cylinder unit and makes 110 PS of power and an impressive 240 Nm of torque. There's not quite a lot that happens when you are below the 2000 rpm mark, but once you are past it, the engine feels peppy and responsive. It does get a bit audible inside the cabin, but that isn't loud enough for you to mind. The drive quality is fantastic and the kicks just cruises over bad patches of roads and potholes. And when the roads are smooth, it feels planted and confident. The huge ground clearance also gives you the confidence to push the kicks even further and when you do, you won't be disappointed as the car copes up very well. The steering is a bit heavy at low speeds but provides excellent feedback at higher speeds and when you are tackling rough terrains. So overall, the Nissan Kicks not only looks the part but does the job of being an SUV rather well. And when you consider the price tag that it comes with, well, it is safe to say that Nissan has come out with a worthy contender in the fast-growing SUV space in India. So now it's time for the verdict. Well, the guys over at Nissan have really thought it through and have got their list of priorities right in terms of what the Indian buyer wants from this segment. So if you're looking for your next SUV and want to stand out from the crowd, the Nissan Kicks is something you should definitely check out. Now, if you're in the market looking for an affordable smartwatch that also keeps a track of your fitness, well, there are several options out there. But don't make up your mind before you hear what Kunal has to say about the Amazfit Watch smartwatch. You might have not heard of this name, but Xiaomi-backed Chinese brand Huami has been selling quite a few fitness products in India. The latest is the Amazfit Verge, which is claimed to offer quite a bit of fitness features, a 5-day battery life, and you can even make phone calls if you're connected to an Android smartphone. The Verge is easily one of the most comfortable smartwatches on the market. Mind you, it's more of a sporty wearable. So, it isn't going to be a great companion for your formal events. There's a round dial up front with thick bezels around it. It isn't the slimmest watch, but the main body is made out of plastic, keeping the overall weight in check. The watch comes in black, blue and white color variants and includes a soft silicon base strap. But in case you don't like the material, you can swap them out. Overall, the watch feels pretty comfortable for all day use and one can even wear it to bed as it can track your sleep patterns. There's a single button on the right side which acts as the home key and doubles as the power button. You also get an inbuilt microphone, speaker, a heart rate sensor as well as built-in GPS to track your movement. The display is a 1.3 inch AMOLED touchscreen which offers excellent brightness even under bright daylight. It is also quite responsive, renders good colors and is protected with Gorilla Glass 3. Speaking of protection, the Verge is IP68 rated, which means it can withstand splashes and sweat, but you can't take it out for a swim. Like Huami's other products, the Verge runs on a proprietary software called Amazfit OS. It comes with a limited number of watch faces, 11 to be specific, which can be a deal breaker for some. Also, you can't install any third-party apps. The watch is however capable of showing notifications from your phone and you can customize what apps can send notifications to your wrist. It works well for most part, but there are minor instances where the notifications are delayed. Also, you cannot interact with them, so they just sit there on the watch until you swipe them off. The watch can also notify you when you get a phone call and best of all, you can pick it up right from the watch itself. You can even directly dial via the watch. Now while this feature does sound very cool, I found talking to my wrist a little silly, especially in public. As for the fitness features, the watch can track various activities apart from walking and running. It can track cycling both indoors and outdoor, indoor running on a treadmill, climbing, skiing and even sports like tennis and football. 
The GPS and compass help in tracking your movement, although the movement tracking isn't completely accurate. In my tests, I found that the watch was off by 5 to 10 percent, which isn't all that bad. The heart rate sensor is pretty good though, but you need to manually test this as the automatic heart rate tracking only works during workout sessions. Now, the best part about this watch is the battery life. The company claims up to 5 days of battery life, which is on spot if you don't log a whole lot of workout activity. For its price, the Amazfit Verge is surprisingly a decent smartwatch. It's comfortable, offers a bright AMOLED display and an excellent battery life. Having said that, if you are very particular about tracking your fitness, this might not be the product to go for as it isn't 100% accurate. Not to mention the limited watch faces and the inability to download third-party apps. But for someone who wants basic functionality out of a smartwatch, including fitness tracking, the Verge feels quite worth every penny spent. Now, when we talk about the Indian automotive market, well, it is on its way to become one of the fastest growing automotive markets in the world. And we are seeing more acceptance of premium motorcycle offerings and premium car offerings as well. But the brand that I'm referring to in particular is Lamborghini India, which has been seeing successive year-on-year -year growth year after year. Well, what is their strategy and what are their plans for the future? Well, at the launch of the Huracan Evo, we got in touch with someone special to find out more. I'm Sharad Agarwal, I head Automobile Lamborghini India. Until now, we were leading the super sports car segment in India, but in 2018, we also launched the Lamborghini Urus, the game changer for us, the first super SUV from Lamborghini. Uh, Urus has brought in a new set of customers for us in India and also worldwide and which has led to phenomenal growth success story. And I'm very, very proud to say that today we are not only leading the super luxury, super sports car segment in India, but we are also leading the super luxury space in India. So India is always on priority and every product which is uh, being launched by Lamborghini will be brought to this country for our customers. This is the Huracan Evo. Uh, Huracan is the best seller in the history of Lamborghini. With Huracan Evo, we aim to amplify the everyday life of our customers. We want to give them a most unique and personal experience in terms of driving dynamics and the emotions of the car. And to make this happen, we have worked on four key pillars in this car. With first of it is the driving dynamics and the emotions of the car. Second is the design and the aerodynamics of the car. We worked on the powertrain of the car and fourth, we also worked on the machine and human interface of the car. See, the Lamborghini experience is about driving dynamics and the emotions of the car. And uh, what we believe in that the technology which is in electric today is not able to deliver those driving dynamics and the emotions which a customer is looking for in a Lamborghini. Yes, if we see that uh, the technology is evolving and is capable to deliver the same driving dynamics and emotions and also the same Lamborghini DNA to our customers, we will evaluate the technology in future. And with that, we've come to the end of this edition of the Tech & Auto Show. How did you find the show? Is there anything you have to say, anything you want us to cover, or you simply want to have a conversation? Well, hit us up on Twitter, we're ready to talk. If it's about technology, you can reach out to us at News18 Tech. If it's about automobiles, you can tweet out to us at News18 Auto. And remember, by logging on to News18.com, you can read more about the Ducati Scrambler 1100 Sport. That's about all for today. We'll catch you same time next week, only on CNN News18.